Thank you. In this project video, I showcase my experiments thus far on hybrid ceramic stripe faces that utilize spheres rather than monolithic tiles. We'll be discussing different packing configurations, elastomer resins, and future improvements on these designs, as well as a PDF that goes with this video. That's a lot to cover, so let's get started. Now this configuration right here, I mean, look at this, one, two, three, four shots of these different uh, ballistic threats. None of them made it through the composite backer. This is probably by far one of the best configurations I've found so far. I really like this one. Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. So today we are discussing these hybrid ceramic strike faces that utilize ceramic balls rather than traditional uh, tile configurations encased in an elastomer resin which results in a, fair, a pretty flexible ceramic strike face that can be cast in different shapes. This has been a very fun project and I felt like I finally had enough data to condense it down into a video essentially as well as a PDF. This project's the first one where I actually sat down, wrote out a full, you know, a full length write-up that you can download yourself. If you go down into the description of this video, uh, there'll be a link and you can pick up the PDF for it. This video goes along with that PDF. Essentially it's following the same format as it. So we're gonna discuss where this idea came from you know, some of the materials I tried, the different elastomers, the different ceramics, different size, configurations, whole bunch of information. So this video might be, you know, fairly long compared to other videos I made. Also, I want to give a brief mention that we hit 20,000 subscribers. Thank you all for sharing my videos and liking and commenting. I really appreciate it. Never thought we would actually get to 20. And that's, that's awesome. So thank you all for that very much. So. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started in it, all right? So the guide starts at where this idea essentially came from. Traditionally, armor utilizes larger tile arrays or monolithic tiles to break up ballistic threats and make it easier to catch them. At least ceramic composite hybrids do. So you'll have a large piece of like this, alumina oxide that will break up the bullet and catch it in the composite backer, right? Or sometimes a smaller tile array, like this one that I created, that had smaller pieces to it. When we talk about hybrid, hybrid uh, strike faces, the one that stands out and probably the one that people are the most familiar with is LIBA, which stands for Light Improved Ballistic Armor. Now, Liba doesn't use uh, balls or spheres. They actually use pellets that are cylindrical with dome tops that are tightly packed with an elastomer resin encasing them. It is supposedly has better ballistic uh, effects than traditional monolithic in the aspect that it can be easier to repair after it's been damaged. It has better blast protection. Obviously, one of the biggest interests in it is its flexibility. Now Liba is owned by this one company that allows other companies to essentially get rights to that name. It's just that Liba has kind of become the name of this type of armor even though it's owned by one company. And I want to point that out because other companies have been attempting to create something along these lines. You can find patents that online. I found about four of them that have expired one way or another. Um, I've also found numerous research papers on this topic. So it's clear that other people are interested in breaking up the ceramic down to the smallest amount and encasing it in elastomers and other materials. A prime example of that kind of throwback to the old Soviet Union and everything is the, the turret for the uh, T-64 they often called the super porcelain armor or ultra porcelain armor that used large alumina oxide spheres encased in metal. Now, 
obviously that's not the same as an elastomer resin, but it's just interesting to see that then the idea of kind of breaking up a ceramic from being a larger monolithic tile and kind of, you know, forging it down into a sphere or a pellet or a cylinder has been around for quite some time. And I kind of like the idea of encasing it in metal. That's kind of interesting from a vehicle armor perspective. So I just wanted to give a basis of where this idea initially came from when I first started doing research and probably use the name that everybody knows, which is Liba. But there are other ones out there, which is pretty interesting too. So next up is my very first experiments. I started with um, glass marbles that were 5 eighths of an inch in diameter and high density polyethylene. The main reason for this is glass is really cheap and HDPE is essentially free because I would just grind up um, milk jugs and water jugs. To do that I took a blender and just ground it down into a very very fine essentially powder and small chips right I made a wood or a metal mold that was uh, internal space was six inches by six inches and four inches deep right and when I first worked on these plates I factored how much high density polyethylene I needed by essentially just packing this powder and chips in the bottom of it and measuring how much it equaled out like for thickness and everything. So the very first experiment, I calculated how many balls I needed by just essentially putting as many that would fit in that mold. Once I had that number, I laid down a layer of high density polyethylene, brought it up to temperature in an oven, laid in all the glass spheres, and then packed more of this powder and chips around the balls and on top of it. Then I compressed it and melted it in the oven at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It worked pretty well, all things considering. One of the big issues is that uh, when you start adding pressure and the mold itself had a little bit of space around the balls, it moved out of the configuration I wanted and kind of did these rows rather than, well, hexagonal packing, which we'll cover here in a little bit. Another method I tried used a griddle where I just took the mold and insulated the outside of the metal, uh, brought it up to temperature closer to right under 400 degrees Fahrenheit, laid out the marble so they could be brought up to temperature. And then I did that same layering as I had done before. I never test or I never shot these uh, primarily because even though glass is a decent strike face, you know, these are kind of heavy, but one of the main reasons is I'm not uh, finished with this method. I'm still refining it because between grinding up the high density polyethylene and then like layering it, it's just a very time consuming process. It can work, but I'm still refining it. One of the issues I've been having is high density polyethylene goes under creep as it cools. And so they're starting to warp over time. And you'll also notice some small cracks forming between the balls and the high density polyethylene. I think this could be resolved by either annealing and also adding a bit more uh, consistent pressure when it's formed and more high density polyethylene because the backside isn't forming those cracks. So there's, there's definitely more refinement that's needed before I can say that high density polyethylene will work for this application. I primarily wanted to test this versus an elastic resin, but due to time constraints, this is just kind of sat on the back burner, essentially, because when I started moving into elastomers, they're a lot quicker to turn over than this. I think if we do maybe a bench top injection molder, we might be able to kind of resolve this issue, or if I come up with a better way of layering and then heating it, but I'll let you guys know in further iterations, because I'm not done with this method. I just chose to forego it for just kind of the traditional elastic resin perspective. But yeah, so, and the very first elastic resin one I used was this flex seal right here, this clear flex seal. I just picked it up down at the hardware store and I used these six millimeter uh, porcelain balls. 
I set it up in a 5x5 five five inch wooden mold, which ended up being the mold I used for all my follow-up plates. And after I cast it, I let it sit for a few days, and then I pulled it out of the mold, and I just tried to do a simple bend test, right? And it just rips right in half. This resin is absolutely shit. I mean, it encased the, the, the balls, but it does not hold together worth a damn. So this was just an absolute failure. If you're ever trying to attempt this, stay away from this Flex Seal liquid crap, man. It is absolutely worthless, okay? And focus more on the one that I, or really anything is probably better than that stuff. But the one I ended up going with is called Simpact. And I bought two different versions of it. So let's go ahead and get in into that. So Simpact, I've used it way back in the day for some lamination of some uh, flexible inserts I was working on. And it was fantastic. I really like the results of this stuff. I never really debuted it because I was still dialing it in and it's just one of those projects that kind of fell off on the wayside. However, I remembered how well I like this stuff. It sets up really good, it's very quick, and they have multiple different uh, versions of the Simpack series. I chose the 85A and the 60. It, they even come with their own like data sheets, which is really cool. The main reason why I chose these two different ones was to test the different tensile strengths, the, the different, um, let's see, oblongation at breaks are different, the overall shore hardness, obviously one is 68 and one is 85. So I wanted to compare kind of the mechanical properties of the elastic resin. Would a more elastic or a higher shore hardness, higher tensile strength one, which one would be better essentially? And then I utilize these to break up into multiple different uh, tile configurations essentially. So let's go ahead and get into that. All right, so now that the resins were selected and I kind of knew the direction I wanted to go in with the mold size and everything, it was time to select some of the ceramics. For this first go, I went with alumina oxide and porcelain in a few different sizes for each. These are sold as tumbling media and they have a pretty consistent size and shape. You know, all things considered, they're not exactly perfect. I did a sampling of each of them to see the variance in the sizes using a caliper. Now, one of the things about porcelain that I've always kind of worried about is consistency from manufacturer to manufacturer. I've used porcelain plenty of times on this channel, right? Alumina oxide is more the traditional ballistic approach for a ceramic, right? The three big ones are silica carbide, boron carbide, and uh, alumina oxide. Those are the ones that you generally see for ballistic plates. Porcelain, however, is not really something you see in modern armor. And I'm always worried from manufacturer to manufacturer, you know, some inconsistency because there isn't an exact you know, recipe for porcelain. Each manufacturer seems to have its own herbs and spices. Porcelain is nothing more than uh, kaolin, quartz, silica, and a few other raw materials that are kilned at a pretty high temperature. I often find industrial porcelain to have concentrations of alumina oxide. It's often added. Even commercial porcelain will have alumina oxide doped into it into the mix because it's centered at such a high temperature it actually starts to reach the temperatures where alumina oxide center if you use porcelain it's very important to kind of focus in on one manufacturer and test multiple times for consistency i found great success with porcelain right i mean some of my best plates use just porcelain tiles that i can get down at lowe's like this one right here I just, when I, when I try to go through the manufacturing, I, I'm often considering, you know, is it a failure because of the raw material or is it a failure because the design is just flawed? 
and it sucks when you have inconsistencies, right? Porcelain generally, though, has been very consistent and reliable for me. Uh, just some things to consider if you are trying to research this yourself. You may want to go with more alumina oxide than porcelain. It's There is a price difference, but, you know, I went with more porcelain because it was cheaper. I did do quite a few with alumina oxide, too, but considering it was almost two to one with how many porcelain ones I did in different configurations. So that's just something I feel like you should consider when doing it. Porcelain is generally assumed to have a density around 2.4 grams per square, 2.4 centimeters cubed with a Mohs hardness of seven. I don't know why I lost my place there, but luckily I picked it back up pretty quickly. <laughs> I also bought all the porcelain from the same uh, distributor on eBay. I'll put a link in the description if you want to buy the exact porcelain I did, okay? The uh, alumina oxide ceramic spheres were picked up from MSC Supplies. They list their alumina oxide ceramic at 92% main material, a density of 3.6 uh, centimeters cubed, and a hardness of 80 HRA. So, you know, it's pretty on point and average for other forms of alumina oxide. Uh, generally, from a ballistic standpoint, um, Alumina oxide is usually centered at a, a higher percentage than 92%. You know, like this one right here that I have is a, a closer to like a 97, 98%. So there's, you know, extra material in there. Do with that information as you would. I mean, I, I might be more interested in finding a manufacturer that does a higher purity alumina oxide in the future, but this stuff worked pretty well, so, you know, I stick with what uh, the data I have here. So, now that the mold and the resin and the different ceramic sizes were figured out, it was time to um, actually pack the balls and the resin. So, let's talk about object density packeting uh, spear packing problems and circle packing problems and kind of how I factored actually forming them into the mold to cast the resin into and kind of the different solutions I came up with. Okay? Alright, so now that the mold, resin, and ceramics were selected, it was time to actually, you know, start packing them into the mold. And I wanted the tightest configuration possible within the 5x5, five five, you know, boundary. And to assist with this, I started studying circle packing and uh, spear packing problems to try to figure out what's the densest I could get the uh, configuration because, you know, I don't want any void spaces in between the uh, balls because that would lead to a failure in the array. If it hits that and it's not hitting any ceramic, then guess what? It's just going to pass right through the resin, essentially. You want it to strike the ceramic and corresponding areas around it. So upon doing some research, I found that pretty much the hexagonal uh, packing configuration or arrangement is the densest possible without being in like a bounded area. So if you had infinite space and it could just go on. And that was the goal. I wanted to try to hit that because on a single layer of balls, circles essentially you can get a density of around 91 percent so then the rest of it you know the eight percent is just the resin that would be essentially holding it together that's for single layer to do this when i had the mold i would often put in enough just to fill the bottom and if any were jutted out on the sides i would remove those so there was actually less because of this configuration you don't always get the maximum amount that would be allowed in, right? So that's a part of it is that to get the hexagonal packing configuration, sometimes I would have to leave space on the edges of the mold between the ceramic balls and the actual mold itself. I used a pick to kind of assist me at layering it in. 
because I was going through so, so many different sizes, I didn't stop to like make a mold for each individual one. Because I think that's the next step to really get a tight configuration where there's not possible void spaces in between it. But this method worked pretty well, as you can see. Um, now for double stacked, because quite a few of the configurations I did was for you know double stacked of the same size, I used what's known as, it's pretty much the hexagonal, but double stacked on top, or H, HCP, or hexagonal close packing. So that's when the spheres, essentially each, when you look at it, uh, a single layer, like one, one row will be longer than the next row. So you have this kind of uh, configuration, which is where it kind of forces that hexagonal, right? Well, when you have two layers of that, it's offset slightly. So you have one side that'll have less balls than the other side, essentially. So you have it slightly augmented. You start, I started this by just doing a single layer of the hexagonal pack, and then would pour in more on top of it and even it out with a pick until I had them all packed in the same configuration. That was with balls of the same size. So when I did two, I did two layers of eight millimeter, I did two layers of 10 millimeter a few different times. I did uh, two, actually three layers of six millimeter that were done in this configuration, the HCP, right? So moving on. And I really like this uh, uh, configuration uh, of the double stack. We'll get into that in a little bit. But the other thing was when I did off sizes. So if I had 10 millimeter with six millimeter, I would start by doing the hex pack on inside the mold with the 10 millimeter first. And then I would layer the six to pretty much fill the void space on top. I didn't want it to be completely uneven and inconsistent, so I just allowed it to naturally form into it. This was a little tedious picking at it to try to get it in line, but I really liked that method too. It made some very interesting patterns throughout it because you know they kind of gravitate towards very specific areas in that array. And uh, I did a, a numerous samples like that. Like I said, I've done 18 samples in total that were shot. Now, as far as actually forming them in the mold and then pouring in the resin, I would first figure out how many it took for that particular sample I wanted to make, pull them out, weigh them. Then I would line the mold itself with just some high density polyethylene bagging material, essentially painter's plastic, and tape it so the resin wouldn't stick to the wood. I then would place them back into that configuration, which could kind of be tedious, and align it. So uh, align it in the configuration I wanted, and took the resin then and poured it in. Now factoring the resin was kind of just by you know touch. I didn't do any major math like to figure out the void space that was needed. That's why some of them, the resin barely like covered the top and other ones were a bit thicker. Generally speaking, I kinda, after the first one, just used that as a reference moving forward, and it worked pretty well, like how much I needed. And what's nice about this stuff is, even though it sets up really quick, it does bind to itself, even once it's starting to set up. So once I poured, if I needed more, I could just quickly mix up more and pour it in. Once the resin was poured in, I would tap the sides and the bottom. I also tried to kind of, especially when they were uh, a little loose because the sides of the mold weren't being touched by the ceramic, I would angle it and sli slightly and pour in the resin. This would help ensure that it got all the way around and underneath with no major air pockets or void spaces. I wanted the resin to truly encase each ball. It would be smart to degas at this step or right before it, you know, in case air pockets were trapped in it, but I just didn't really feel like going through all that hassle. But moving forward, it would be smart to try to remove all the air pack, pa packets that form inside of there. But tapping it with like a pencil or a dowel really worked pretty well. So once those, uh, once they set up, this resin sets up pretty quickly. I could demold them 
every hour or every two hours essentially I could pull them out of the mold and let them cure overnight or actually 44 48 hours before I did anything with them so and through that I made up to 18 of these plates some of which were sister plates and what I mean by that is to test the variables of the resin I actually made two identical things with the only difference being uh, so like 10 millimeter of the hexagonal packing configuration and 10 millimeter both of porcelain or alumina oxide I've done both of those and then I would fill it with the different resins this was hopefully so I could see the the variables of the different resins like you know would the more elastic one outperform the one with the higher shore hardness and tensile strength so on so I also wanted to see consistency if the configuration you know if you have two of the same essentially you can kind of view both of them and see which one you know if this one fails and this one works why is it was my configuration off a little bit or was it the resin so another nice thing about this resin is that it's fairly transparent even when it sets up it's kind of this off-white or milky white so you can use a strong uh, a, a strong light source to essentially look at your configuration through it and that's really nice in case you you know are checking for any inconsistency in your array I try to take as much time to pack them and be you know consistent as possible but it's it was kinda nice being able to look at them it looked cool and just being able to see if everything lined up the way I wanted okay so now let's talk about the backer I attached them all to the list of ballistic samples and actually get into the testing protocol and the ballistic test so now on to the actual uh, samples like I mentioned before I had 18 in total that I was gonna actually take out and shoot um, when I was weighing everything I made sure to uh, weigh the ceramic independent of the resin so I could kind of factor in future how much a ceramic array would weigh and then calculate the resin differently that's why I kind of split it up and then did the uh, total weight um, it's also important to note that you know I didn't always use every little drop of resin so the initial resin weight versus the final weight might not calculate out exactly you know perfectly but that's not a huge deal now as far as these full uh, 18 plates uh, I also started on number two and counted from there so it went from 2 to 19 this was due to the fact that I had already uh, made my first plate the high density polyethylene and in my notes I just kept going and decided when I was attaching them to the backers essentially that I was going to change and not use any of the HDPE ones so the the count starts at 2 and goes to 19 essentially and to save on time I'm just posting what each of them are comprised of right here and obviously you can download the guide and read it that way or you can just pause the video and see it there so now let's get on to the backer and the ballistic protocol that I set up alright so when all 18 of the samples were finally cured up it was time to actually attach them to a backer and go out and you know shoot them to see how they performed for the backer I chose to go with something simple like fiberglass welding blanket and a Bondo polyester resin. The reason I did this, because I know plenty of you are going to be asking, well, wouldn't Kevlar be better or ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fabric, right? That's what these are. Of course, I wanted to go a cheaper route initially because first off, you know, I didn't know how they would handle. And I've had quite a bit of experiments done with welding blanket right that's what this is and yeah even a better form of fiberglass would be better as far as strength to weight and dialing in the resin consumption but like I said didn't know exactly how these were gonna perform so I wanted to go with the tried and true cheap method and kind of be able to reference these other plates as sort of a control when I go out and shoot them right knowing what I know about the welding blanket with a Bondo resin I can kind of dial it in so I went with 30 layers which is kind of on the higher end of the tests I've done before just to try to give these things a bit more um, 
advantage at possibly succeeding and you'll see some of those definitely did once uh, the lamination was very simple just a crude wet up where I just laid it cut them into 15 inch by 15 inch uh, squares should also mention that I planned on attaching multiple as you saw over here multiple of these little 5 by 5s now that they're made to a composite rather than giving each of them their own composite backer I later regretted this decision but that's just it seemed the easiest and simplest as far as the time constraints were concerned rather than cutting you know 30 for each of these I just went with 15 by 15 so I could do nine samples on one nine samples on the other uh, once they the composite was dry and uh, cured up I trimmed it back down to the 15 inch by 15 inch square and attached each of these using a little bit of for half of them I essentially use um, flex seal when I ran out of I actually have the container over here if I thought well here's a video clip of it um the two different resins didn't seem to affect them at all like they handled just fine they didn't fly off so why I chose them both was just as simple as they were available and I had them currently like up in my shelves so I went with those and they both handled really good honestly I was I was surprised the flex seal pace held as much considering the flex seal liquid was just absolute shit right it actually did the paste did pretty good once they were attached I quartered them out because my plan was to test each sample multiple times with various threats right so I put a perimeter of blue this is a half inch of blue and I sectioned it into quarters like this. So it's four inch by four inch red square. So any shots placed in the red were like acceptable, especially because, you know, when I was forming these, the edges often had extra space between the mold and the balls. So if there was gonna be a void space, I wanted it on the perimeter. Hence why I was saying, you know, any shot landed in the blue is not counted and we'll just redo the test. Um, and this also kind of just gives a good reference as we're going through these different tests. Now, for the ballistic threats, we start, I wanted to kind of stagger it in like layers of difficulty, right? So we start a little bit easier and kind of ramp up as we go just to see what its threshold capabilities were and if it had the multi-hit capability that we were kind of looking for, right? So it started off with 123 grain, full metal jacket, 7.62 by 39, shot out of an SKS. Round two is the 5.56, five, uh, this is the 55 grain, um, full metal jacket, also known as the M193. This of course is the green tip, which is a 5.56, five, 62 grain full metal jacket with a steel penetrator, mild steel core, essentially, or plug. The, both of the 5.56 were shot out of an 18 inch barrel, so they didn't reach the, the top velocity that 5.56 can reach. I should mention that. And then finally was the 7.62 by 51, 147 grain full metal jacket, also known as the M80 ball, right? 308, essentially. So that was the like basis. It was going to start at the 7.62. If it passes, then we pick a different quadrant, a different square, and test then with the M193. If it passed, we would move on to the M855. If it passed, it would go on to the 308 by the end, right? And I originally wanted to test again in a different area if it failed, like with some of these, the 7.62 by 39, they just couldn't handle it. So I wanted to test it in a different area, but we were waiting to the very end. Sadly, with both the composite completely failing and kind of why I wish I had done individual rather than bigger ones, which you'll see here in just a bit. Um, after they started failing, we couldn't really go back and test the ones that failed the initial testing or in that, because I just wanted to see if there was a inconsistency of possibly the configuration of balls in there or if it just simply couldn't handle the threat okay so 
once I had the established like protocol I wanted to do, we went out to my buddy's range. I also built this little stand, right, that could perfectly hand, hold them up at a, like a 90 degree from shooter because I wanted them to be straight up and down and we could just easily clamp them on the side and shoot them that way, right? We measured out uh, 30 feet or 10 yards from the, sh the shooter and put up a chronograph so we could record the velocity of each of the projectiles. All right, so yeah, now it's time to actually get into that ballistic footage. For obvious reasons, I'm going to have to shorten it for brevity and you know, this video is already going on pretty long, but we'll go ahead and start um, the actual ballistic footage and go cover the uh, results of those testing. Let me see. Gotta love that smell. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Is that it? Yeah, because I don't think that dot was there. Yeah, you're right. And zero pass through. Zero penetration. So, yep, it started to delaminate on the side. Yeah, that hit. Good. Okay, so we bubbled out. Yeah, so right there, that was kind of an edge strike. Maybe we'll put another one because it looks like it, yeah. Had a failing up the back there. But the other ones, doesn't look like there was a failing. So, yeah, this one worked. Oh, nice. Would you look at that? Perfect. Bit of a failing here though, but we'll, we'll back it over. Because it shot out a bit out the side. Yeah, some of these are really, really close to being fully stopped others you had a full blowout like right there right there but like this one I actually think that was a success not a failure but they're really close cool Three thousand twenty-seven. did you hit oh you hit right there yeah. Right there. Okay. And you hit right there. Pick one of the other quadrants and hit it with the green tip stuff. Well, I knew I was slightly that way and off with the sight, so. That's not bad. And then put me one right there and then right there. Those are the last ones on this plate. This one. Yeah, so that was a. 308 impact right there and right there. That one was close to stopping. But that one blew right through. So that's interesting. All right, last set of tests on these. We're gonna shoot it with the Beowulf. Hopefully. Oh, you'll hit, probably. Yeah, you hit it. Hey. It stopped the bail wolf over oh. Yeah, stopped it. Boom! Yep, there you go. You can say it stops a bail wolf. Let's see what it did on the front yeah, side. Yeah, 50 caliber, baby! <laughs> yeah. yeah! Wow. Right there it is. That's fun. Nice. All right, so now on to the results of testing. Man, huge shout out to uh, Larry and Chris for spending over three hours out there testing all these plates. Now remember, a pass is something that n there's no visible damage to the back of the fiberglass, no material coming through at all. I considered that a pass. A failure was even some splitting. Originally, I wanted to test especially those that were just right on the edge again, but we weren't able to get to all of them. But. I have special notes about that. So here's a bunch of the data just right at you. So out of the 
18 sample tiles, 10 past that first round that was the uh, 7.62 by 39, right? That average velocity was 2,300 feet per second. And those tiles were number 2, 6, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 17. Of those 10 that passed the first round, 9 sample tiles passed the second round. The 556, 55 grain full metal jacket, right? That was tile 6, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 17. Of those nine that passed the second round, six went on to pass the M855, the 62 grain steel core penetrator. And that was tiles 6, 7, 13, 14, 16, and 17. Of those six that passed the third round, three, and kind of probably four, went on to pass the final round, which were tiles 13, 16, and 17. Now, of the failed plates, three were really close to passes, and honestly, they probably should have been considered, as none of the wood was really damaged. Just some minor splitting of the composite backer and some slight dimpling. And those tiles were 9, 19, and 5. I wanted to retest those, like I mentioned. However, total composite failure prevented that. Also, plate 7, this is the one I was about to say, was shot right on the blue border. Okay? Do I have that one up yet? I do not. I do not have that one pulled. It was caught right on the edge with the 308. And I wanted to retest that one just a, really badly because it was performing as well as the other ones that made it all the way to the end. It was double stacked uh, 10 millimeter alumina oxide. And when you kind of see some of the other results, it should have made it all the way to the end. I think it would have had it not hit the blue border and we were able to retest it. So a couple things to note that are interesting. Uh, first off, the tiles are flexible. Right, that's they both versions of the resin ended up being quite flexible in that regard. Even the double stack stuff, when they were double stacked, they're they're a bit stiffer than just a single layer or the smaller balls packed on top of the larger ones. Double stacking hexagonally really does make them denser and not as much flex, but there's still some from the elastic resin. Some of the shots uh, ejected ceramic back at the attacker. This is mostly due to the fact that there wasn't enough resin on the top of the balls as some of the other double stack configurations had a little bit more resin and they didn't fly off. I just thought that was pretty interesting. Another thing to note is how well these tiles actually handled or held up, meaning they didn't blow apart. I mean, this one right here, one of my favorites, number 13, and look at it. It took four different shots, kept going, right? 7.62 by 39, both of the 5.56 and the 308, and did not fail. It did not fall apart. It could have probably been shot a few other times. That's in a four inch by four inch space. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. So, moving on. So, the main issue and why we couldn't retest some of these is this total composite failure. You gotta remember that each of these 15 by 15 got shot over 20 times. One of them was 21 and the other one was 24 times, right? So there was a lot of damage on these tile configurations or really the composite behind them. And it just finally started to give and eventually completely delaminated in spots. And by that point, there's just no retesting of areas because the composite behind it is completely failing. This is pri primarily due to the fact that I used access resin in this build. Fiberglass welding blanket takes a lot of resin and I didn't really compress it too much. It was a very simple wet up. Honestly, a better method on the composite, a stronger composite would have resulted in, you know, more shots, uh, better resin even. But Generally, I'm still satisfied with the results. It just sucks because, you know, I would have liked to shoot them even more, especially the ones that were succeeding. So, 
some other things to consider. But yeah, so the composite completely failed. I put some clips in there for that. Another interesting point is that the porcelain performed just as well and in some cases better than the alumina oxide ceramic. Now, that's kind of not very... kind of... well, we'll get into that. The It's not as fair because there was far less samples of alumina oxide purely alumina oxide versus porcelain. There was more different sizes of porcelain and there were more different configurations. So you kind of expect the um, alumina oxide to kind of lag when it came to it. But the three samples that passed all four rounds were comprised of porcelain balls. However, it's important to note that there were like I said, less alumina oxide and of less sizes. More testing is to is needed to evaluate this fact as it might be due to the manufacture of the balls. Uh, that's also the possibility, you know, the alumina oxide I got might not have been as good. However, some of them did handle just as fine. I mean, it, it's kind of apples to oranges, to be quite honest, because when it's like a two to one on porcelain versus alumina oxide, it's kind of hard to draw perfect comparisons. And one of the double stacked alumina oxide number seven should have performed just as much as the double stacked porcelain, I feel. And I only made one of those. Finally, let's talk about the resins. After the first round of testing, the success of the different resins were split evenly. Five for the 60A, five for the 85A. By rounds three to four, the 85A had twice as many plates as the 60 that were passes. More Round 3 had 4 of the 85A and 2 of the 60. Now I still believe that the configuration of ceramics is mo more important than the resin as the two most successful plates, plates 13 and 17, were sister plates using the same configuration but different resin. Those ones were both, right, the, the ones that made it all the way to the end, beat everything else, were double stacked porcelain in the hexagonal using both resins. So it's kind of hard to say, well, you know, 85A outperformed it. There were more samples of 85A as well, because I bought two containers of 85A versus one container of 60, because as it was ongoing, I just kept making samples. So initially there was more 85A samples that I tested. Still interesting that it seems like the less, um, elastic one and higher shore hardness perform better even with that to be considered more testing is definitely needed to confirm this and possibly with a more elastic resin so my conclusion from these tests was that the hcp packing of eight millimeter and ten millimeter in two layers is the best configuration i found thus far as that was the tiles that made it to the final round of testing Plus number seven, which I mentioned needed to be shot again. It was shot in the blue area, and that had 10 millimeter alumina oxide double stacked. So essentially, boil it down, double stacked eight millimeter and du double stacked 10 millimeter. Those configurations of both porcelain and alumina oxide for the 10 millimeter performed the best out of all of the other plates and configurations. So. All right, so finally now we're on to the final thoughts. I know this has been a lot to digest all at once, but I tried to break it up as best I could to hopefully get as much information out there that goes along with this guide. So essentially the double stacked eight, uh, eight millimeter and 10 millimeter porcelain looks like the best. A part of the final thoughts, I just want to describe some of the other avenues I want to you know, look into. So now the tests are complete. Some of the future experiments I would like to do, I would both like to test uh, cast aluminum around the alumina oxide and porcelain, as well as try to dial in this high density polyethylene matrix. I think that both of those will yield some very interesting results. Uh, aluminum is a pretty ductile metal and uh, HDPE is a very ductile plastic. It would be interesting to see how uh, something with higher plasticity versus elasticity would perform, right? I mean, I've tested 
HDPE countless times and I've been working on making my own forge so I can cast aluminum and I think that that might be a lot of fun. Of course we'll have to dial in heating up the balls so they don't just shatter once we pour molten aluminum and then we can dial in the composition of the actual aluminum alloy. I think that might be very very interesting. I would also like to expand on what I found both with the double stacked 8 millimeter and 10 millimeter. The double stacked 8 millimeter is a little bit thinner, obviously, because it's two 8 millimeter balls in the HCP packing configuration and a little bit lighter. I'd like to try that as aluminum oxide. I'd also like to do a better comparison of porcelain versus aluminum oxide, maybe find a different um, manufacturer of the aluminum oxide just to see if sam uh, purity sampling is a thing and if it gives any different results. It would also be interesting to test out silica carbide or zirconia in these configurations now that we know that double stacked 8mm is kind of the best bet for thin or the thinnest and lightest that we found thus far. I would also like to make a mold that will actually hold it into the configuration like a flexible silicone mold so that it would have dimples for the balls to fit on the bottom and along the side so rather than trying to pack it into you know a wooden mold that it just some of them don't fit r really well in and you'll have extra void spaces actually design a mold that for whatever size let's say eight millimeter they would fit perfectly in the configuration we want probably speed up the process of just packing them in because they'll fit into those little grooves and voids i'd also like to see other elastic resins how flexible can we get it you know one of the most flexible that i had was the 13 millimeter aluminum oxide with six millimeter packed around it it performed pretty well right but i'm curious if we filled the void on the bottom spot also with six millimeter and that one was pretty flexible like how flexible could we actually get one of these strike faces and develop a much stronger flexible backer maybe we can make you know rifle rated plates that were uh, very flexible <laughs> be kind of funny because it's a little rubbery if you hold it out it would kind of droop I would imagine with all that weight but might be interesting but the big thing is now we have a way to mold it into different shapes and that's more exciting for me in case you ever wanted pauldrons or like a sapin panzer mm -hmm. yeah if you want to make curved plates and stuff but with I want to also instead you know institute a more dynamic uh, more scientific, I should say, uh, experimentation. This one was more of a sampling. As you notice, I've used two different types of ceramics of different sizes and different configurations and two different resins. That's a lot of variables that I just kind of threw up. It's because I wanted to sample to get an idea of what might actually work. It's, you know, kind of playing at it, but that's not very, you know, standardized. Ideally, we would just say, okay, only 10 millimeter single layer packing, maybe a different type of packing configuration, double packing, just one resin, the amount, backer known, you know, control every variable. That means a lot more tests are needed in the future and I would really like to pursue it. So moving forward, I think that uh, I just might because uh, this one was very, very interesting. If you guys have any questions about this guide, feel free to drop me a line on my YouTube channel in the comment section. I read them all. I don't always get back to you guys, but I do read them and I'll try to make a point to comment back. I do have a community discord that I'll probably be opening back up for new people that want to join. Huge thank you finally for Chris and Larry yet again and also for all of you for liking, sharing, and subscribing. I doubt very many of you made it all the way to the end, but I appreciate the ones that did. I mean, uh, man, we hit 20,000 what's next right that's so exciting I have a few other videos coming out very soon I actually have a bunch of footage from the summer I need to edit down with my friend Devin who came all the way from France I've been sitting on and I also have a vehicle update that I'm really excited because it's a modular armor system for any vehicle and I think everybody will like it and from there I'm gonna try to go into a few other things maybe even return to this because I've been really excited. And the last page of my th my uh, guide just goes over citation and sources of where I found the photos and everything. If you go down to the description, 
uh, of this video, you'll find all these links, including other ones that I might have used along the way. I'm not really great. I haven't worked on a paper in a long time, so if I messed up any citation, please let me know. And just say, hey, Tech, you should have done this or messed that up. I apologize if I did. And I will correct it both in my description and in later iterations because I think I'll do a 2.0 of this in the future. All right, guys. That's That was a mouthful. So Merry Christmas. Thanks again. I will see you all in the next one. And a huge shout out also to my Patreon supporters. Most of these plates were paid for by those guys. And uh, I am planning to still do that Sap and Panzer. Probably going to use this for the strike face. Once I get past the vehicle, we'll talk about actual large plates. I'm pretty excited about it. See you all in the next one. Take care.